Hey, if you're new, you might have noticed that we just had an offering, but we didn't pass any plates or anything. Uh, there are two uh, plates there in, in the back, so you can drop something off in your, on your way out if you'd like, or you can give online. People often come to me with huge wads of cash and concern because the plates are too little. So if, you know, if that's your problem, you can meet me by the dumpster and give the money directly to me. But Anyway, seriously, um, we are two weeks away from the midterm elections, and I did not plan this out, but in our series through Romans, we happened to come across Romans chapter 13 uh, this week, and today I'm pretty much guaranteed to offend everyone. So I want to point out three books that have really influenced me and I'd love you to read that are kind of on this topic. Number one, The Politics of Jesus, by John Howard Yoder. Um, he's a Mennonite scholar. That's a good book. And this is an amazing book, The Cost of Discipleship by Dietrich uh, Bonhoeffer. And uh, this is the epic book that I wish everyone would leave, read, even though it's a challenge to understand. Karl Barth, The Epistle to the Romans. The chapter on chapter 13 of Romans is, is amazing. Now, Bart and Bonhoeffer, uh, they wrote their books while a fellow named Adolf Hitler was rising to power in Germany. So it's not just your standard American evangelical Christian fluff. There's some real meat there. So let's pray. Lord God, I'm scared to talk about these things. And so I pray that you would give us courage. Give all of us courage, Lord God, to preach your gospel and to believe your gospel and to live your gospel in this crazy world. In Jesus' name, we ask these things. Amen. Romans chapter 13, verse 1, English Standard Version. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. Now that seems clear enough, doesn't it? So uh, who's the governing authority for us? Well, I think Paul's saying about governing authorities of this world, so I, I think that would be Joe Biden and the Democratic House and the Republican Senate and a whole bunch of, of courts. And you say, no, I'm sorry. We are a constitutional democracy, which means everyone's in authority. Everyone's in authority to determine the majority who is then our authority, and yet it's all kind of feeling sort of like anarchy. Not authority. You know, there's only one clear instance of democracy in Scripture. And that was the day that the crowd voted for Jesus Barabbas and voted to crucify Jesus of Nazareth. From the Old Testament, with reference to the Jubilee and some other passages, one can make a pretty good argument that socialism is the ideal set forth in Scripture. But with reference to all the buying and selling and Jesus' stories about stewardship, you could make a pretty good argument no, capitalism is the ideal set forth in Scripture, but this much seems very clear to me. When Republicans are in power, they love to quote Romans 13, 1 through 7, and complain about all of the riots in our major cities, revolution. And when Democrats are in power, they love to quote Romans chapter 13, verses 1 through 7, and complain about January 6th and riots at the Capitol revolution. Verse 2, therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment, for rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what is good, and you will receive his approval, for he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain, for he is the servant of God, an avenger, who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. 
Therefore, one must be in subjection not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. For because of this, you also pay taxes, for the authorities are ministers of God attending to this very thing. Pay to all what is owed to them. Taxes to whom taxes are owed, revenue to whom revenue is owed, respect to whom respect is owed, honor um, to whom honor is owed. Now hopefully you see some minor complications with the um, implications of and applications of, of this text. In, in, in my experience, most popular expositors will make an argument kind of like this. Well, you know, Paul is speaking kind of in general terms. After 12 chapters of painstakingly precise theological argumentation, well, you know, he's basically spitballing it. <laughs> and we know what he means, right? We know, we know what he means, common sense. Others will actually make the argument that things were, well, they were simpler back then. And the uh, Roman authorities actually came to Paul's defense a, a time or two. So let's talk about that for, for a minute. Basically, all scholars are unanimous in dating Paul's epistle to the Romans uh, somewhere between 55 and 57 AD. That's just about 25 years after Christ was crucified, and so we know exactly who the governing authorities were at that time, particularly in Rome. If you're confused about the meaning of our text, you can just plug this guy's name in wherever you read authority. I don't know who you're planning to vote for, and I'm not going to tell you, but let me say anyone on your ballot, in my opinion, would be better than this guy. His name is, is Nero, Emperor Nero. He murdered his own mother, kicked his pregnant wife to death, then married a young boy that he had castrated and then repeatedly dressed to look like the bride whom he had just murdered. In 64 AD, a fire broke out in Rome, and in order to divert suspicion from himself, according to the, this is the secular historian Tacitus, Nero blamed the Christians and then he delighted in executing them for sport. Some were dipped in oil, according to Tacitus, then crucified and lit on fire to shed light on Nero's garden parties. Others were sewn in animal skins, torn apart by dogs, for the enjoyment of the crowds in the Colosseum. In 66 AD, Nero ordered Vespasian to lay siege to Jerusalem, which fell to Rome in 70 AD, just as Christ prophesied that it would in one generation. In biblical numerology, the number of Nero's name is 666. Uh, there's a variant also 616, but, but, but they both add up to, to, to Nero, identify him as the beast from the sea in the Revelation. And so much of the early church identified Nero as the Antichrist. It was under Nero that Peter was crucified upside down and Paul was beheaded. And yet you could argue, well, Paul didn't know that at the time of the writing of Romans because Nero was, you know, kind of the new emperor. Claudius, Nero's stepfather, had been emperor before Nero, 41 to 54. It was Claudius that expelled the Jews from, from Rome including Aquila and Priscilla. You can read about that in Acts chapter 8. They're Paul's friends, his good friends and fellow tent makers. Before Claudius, from 37 to 41 AD, was a fellow named Caligula. He held the throne. He was the very first emperor to publicly claim to be God, demand worship as God, and even call for his image to be erected in the temple in Jerusalem. There is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God, writes Paul to the Romans long about 56 AD. So we think, well, okay, well, maybe Paul was referring, you know, to the Jewish uh, authorities in Jerusalem, the high priests and the Sanhedrin. In Romans 15, 25, 
Paul's going to tell us that he's on his way to Jerusalem with an offering for the poor, and then he plans to go on to Rome. From the book of Acts, we know that the authorities try to kill him in Jerusalem, uh, but Paul appeals to, to Caesar. He's, he's, he appeals to Caesar, but he's imprisoned for years and then finally beheaded in, in Rome. By the time Romans is, is written, according to 2 Corinthians 11, Paul has already been imprisoned multiple times, received countless beatings. He's been publicly stoned, beaten with rods three times, and, and flogged five times, all by the authorities. Flogged. The 40 lashes less one because 40 was said to kill a person. And we just read, rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Do what is good and you will receive his, his, his approval. Do what is, did Jesus do what is good? Do we seriously think that Paul in Romans chapter 13 just kind of forgot that Jesus, literally God in flesh, that Jesus only 25 years earlier had been crucified on a tree in a garden by the Jewish authorities, colluding with the Roman authorities, relying on the authority of the first democratic election recorded in, in Scripture? I mean, did Paul just kind of forget that? And did he forget that Jesus had said, any who would be my disciple must pick up a cross and follow? You know, by law, only the Roman authorities were allowed to pound the nails. <laughs> and do you know how they paid for the nails? Taxes. <laughs> Romans 13, verse 6, the authorities are ministers of God. Because of this, you pay taxes. The Romans used tax money to violently persecute Christians and Jews as well as fund their lavish garden parties, sexual debauchery, violence, followed by the common, common, very common practice of abortion and, this is easier, infanticide. And Jesus told the Jews to, quote, render unto Caesar that which is Caesar's. And we know for sure that Jesus paid taxes to the Jewish authorities. I mean, you, 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 the ones that would have him killed, he had Peter go get the money out of a fish. Be subject to the governing authorities. Ecusia also translated powers, I think usually in the King James. Uh, the rulers, archon, uh, usually translated princes, I think in the King James, that's principalities. And you see, this is all just so weird for us because in other places like Ephesians chapter 6, Paul writes this. We battle not, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the principalities, the archon, against the uh, authorities, the acousia, the, the powers, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual host of wickedness in the heavenly places. So we're to be subject to the authorities and... Battle them. <laughs> Make sense? Colossians 1.16, Paul writes this. In heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, the thrones or dominions, rulers or authorities, same word in Greek, all things were created through Christ and for Christ. So what does Paul mean by rulers and authorities? If you study it, I think you'll see what theologians like Henrik Burkhoff have brilliantly asserted, like in his book, Christ and the Powers. And that is that Paul is referring to basically all organizational systems that govern our daily existence in this age. That would include civil governments, cultures, languages, psychologies, and sociologies, educational systems, economic systems, and the fallen angelic authorities that inhabit those systems and animate those systems according to Scripture. The biblical view is that it's all created by God. And yet, like humanity, it's all fallen and infected with evil. The very first ecousia is built by Cain, Right after he murders his brother Abel. Remember, God sentences him to wander the earth, 
But in disobedience, he builds the very first city. What is that? That's an organizational system for fallen man. This is really rather shocking to study, but there really are no good acousia until one descends from heaven. Not the old Jerusalem, the great harlot who rides the beast, but the new Jerusalem coming down. She's a living body. There are none good until then. And it is really difficult to wait, isn't it? Because we want vengeance. Solomon wrote, because the sentence against an evil deed is not executed speedily, the heart of the children of Adam is fully set to do evil. That's why we love the authorities. They execute judgments against evil deeds according to law. And that's why we're never satisfied. Because all their judgments, well, they're just more evil. You say you want a revolution. Well, you know, we all want to change the world. You say you got a real solution. You know what's going to be? All right. You know what's going to be? All right. So Paul writes, let every person be subject to the authorities and rulers, and he writes, we battle against them. What the heck? Maybe we should read this in context. You know, there were no chapter divisions in Paul's letters. I, I, they were added like over a thousand years later. I think he would just be mortified to find out that we had chopped them up in order to put them on like, you know, desktop calendars and refrigerator magnets. But anyway, let's start kind of around where we left off last time. And and um, I'm, I'm going to try to I'm going to try to give you the most literal translation. So that's the reason for all the scratches and stuff. Not to say the other's totally wrong, but to give you a more precise idea of what Paul actually wrote. Romans 12:14. Bless those as we've been talking about the last few. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Verse 17. Repaying no one evil for evil, but providing good before all. Verse 19. Not avenging yourselves, beloved, but give space to the wrath. Now, of God is added by the translators in a lot of these verses, but he just says to the wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. But indeed, moreover, yes, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. For by so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome be conquered by the evil, but overcome, conquer the evil, literally in the good. Let every person be subject, submit to the, or just to governing, to higher authorities. So right before what we read earlier, he, he ended with the, this thought, and he, I don't think he ended, he just kept going. He said, do not be conquered by the evil, but conquer the evil in the good. So, what is the good? This is the good. In flesh, hanging on a tree, in a garden. Now, if you haven't been following these sermons or what Paul has been saying in the book of Romans, this may all sound like a bunch of jibber-jabber to you, and you're probably going to have a million questions and objections to what I'm going to say. But if you pay attention... I think God might just use this news to set you free from the rulers and authorities and the spiritual host of wickedness in the heavenly places and the authority of our adversary, Satan. This is the tree of the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil in the middle of the garden that is in the sanctuary of, I believe, every human soul. This is the tree of law. And uh, according to Paul, each of us has been tricked into taking fruit from this tree in order to create ourselves in the image of God, in order to justify ourselves. That is, make ourselves 
right. But we haven't made ourselves right. We've actually trapped ourselves in a prison of wrong, a body of sin and death, which Paul refers to as the flesh. So this is the good. Jesus said God alone is good. So this is the good in flesh, like fruit, hanging on a tree in the middle of the garden. And this is the life. Because Jesus is the life in flesh, like fruit, hanging on the tree in the very same spot, the middle of the garden. When we take knowledge of the good in order to make ourselves in the image of God, we also take the life of the good who is God, and for us, everything dies. And we become slaves, not free, slaves, slaves of the evil we become vessels of wrath. You can think of wrath as life that's been bottled up in an earthen vessel. The way, you know, Jesus was bottled up in an earthen tomb, a tomb of stone. You experience wrath when a person takes life and refuses to, to give life. And yet every child of Adam does this very same thing continually. In other words, we all refuse to love. Love is a decision to give life as you have received life. Love is presenting your body a sacrifice to God in the temple that is your neighbor. Law reveals that we should love, but we don't love, (laughs) for we have chosen the evil. Law is good, but the way that we take it is the very definition of the evil. And now we're all beginning to know it, right? Well, that's what we've been preaching for a year. And so now the question is, okay, that was a review. Now the question is, what is a governing authority? What is a higher authority? What is the, what is this, the authorities that Paul is talking about? What, what is an authority? Well, think about this. It's legislation, right? And that means the making of laws. When Paul speaks of law, he's not just, this is what Christians have said, and I think this totally misses the point. He's not just speaking about Old Testament law. He's talking about any law. Any knowledge of good and evil taken and imposed upon the human psyche. The Ten Commandments were perhaps the best law because God wrote them in stone and handed them to Moses. And yet, we all took law in the beginning and buried it in our hearts, our hearts of stone. So anyway, a governing authority is legislation. And the judgment of those under the legislation, and the execution. So it's legislative, judicial, and executive. The execution of rewards and punishment for all within that organizational system. And so isn't a human government simply evil, organizing evil? None is righteous, no, not one, wrote Paul. So did we seriously think that by organizing ourselves, we could right the wrong? Karl Barth writes, is there anywhere legality which is not fundamentally illegal? <laughs> Let me just say that one more time. He, he asked this question, is there anywhere legality which is not fundamentally illegal? <laughs> You could chew on that one for a year or two. So how do the rulers and authorities operate? Well, at their best, which may actually be their worst, they appeal to your passions. What passions? The passions of the flesh. That is the desires of us vessels of of wrath. And so, hey, check this out. I, I brought my basket of vessels of wrath, remember from previous uh, sermons, so I'll put some of them out here. You remember we, we talked about, about all of these. 
Two sermons ago, I had each of these, or at least some of these to show you, I had them encased in clay, remember? Because each of us has taken the life and refused to surrender the life, so the vessel has really become a container so that the life doesn't flow through it, it's just stuck in it. In other words, each one dies, uh, refuses to surrender the life, which is death. We're, we've imprisoned the life in a vessel of clay and then called it our own. <laughs> this is my life. My life is what we say. And at that, the governing authorities appeal to our passions. They appear to my, my passions. They say something like this. Hey, you have a right to that life, Peter. And you, you have a right to freedom, to, to liberty. And you have a right to happiness, that is blessing. And well, we will grant those rights by forming a covenant to protect you from all who would violate your rights. A covenant of, of self-interest. You know, in order to protect ourselves from well, having to lose ourselves. Or maybe I start a government. How do I do that? Well, I say something like this. Hey, I'm a six-inch pipe. This is my life. That's my judgment. And hey, you also look like a six-inch pipe. Let's join ourselves together <laughs> in order to protect ourselves from, from these 90 and 45 degree uh, elbows. Let's, uh, let's join together. Let's, let's bind ourselves together uh, like kind of in a covenant or something. Um, there we go. Ha! <laughs> And then what happens? Well, the elbows get a little intimidated uh, by this, and uh, they uh, join together to protect their, their rights from those straight pipes who would violate their right to life, which is actually death, and would violate their right to freedom, which is actually bondage. And so, you know, they, they band together too. Get some of these guys like this. Well, and then the straight pipes, they look at this, and they feel, they feel a little intimidated, right? And they say, well, you, you're so intolerant. We're tolerant, and so we're not only the six-inch straight pipes, we're also bound together well, with four-inch straight pipes. Ha! And then it gets most dark and most evil when they begin to say, and this is the will of God. This is life and liberty and, and freedom. Now let me ask you. There we go. There's two gov governing authorities. These, these people are just wandering in the wilderness. What is the vengeance that these authorities provide? Well, if someone takes your life, liberty, or happiness, they help you take that someone's life, liberty, or happiness, right? As if that would make you happy, free, or alive. It's the lex talionis. An eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, a life for a life, a slap on the cheek for a slap on the cheek. If someone takes your coat, you take their coat. That's a part of divinely prescribed justice for the Hebrews in the wilderness. And it was a part of justice in my home when my children were little. Like I told you a while ago, one day my daughter Elizabeth bit Susan on the bottom when she bent over vacuuming. Elizabeth was about three at the time. The doctor told Susan that she needed to bite Susan, or Elizabeth on the bottom just so that Elizabeth would know how it felt. In other words, so that she would have knowledge of, of evil. Bite on the bottom, repaid with a bite on the bottom. Knowledge of evil, you see, is an important step in the development of any child who one day will maybe choose the good in freedom. 
But knowledge of evil is definitely not the same as being known by the good and knowing the good. You know, it's been 30 years now since Elizabeth bit Susan on the bottom, and I don't think Elizabeth is even tempted to bite Susan on the bottom anymore. But she just delights in doing good for her mom. For in all those years, Susan always showered Elizabeth with unconditional good, even, even, even as she bit her on the bottom 30 years ago. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye. But I say to you, if someone slaps you on the cheek, turn the other also. Do not resist the one who is evil. Said the good in human flesh at just the right stage of human development. Jesus fulfills the law. Even the lex talionis. We all took the life from the tree in the garden and Jesus gave the life at the tree in the garden for us, and even in us, he returned our life, which is his life, to the Father. He returned the very life that we had taken even as we took it, for your life is actually his life. You have no right to life. It's all his life. He lifted his head and he cried out, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. The spirit is life. And the life is in the blood. So did Jesus repay evil with evil? Or did he conquer the evil? As the good. In other words, what is the vengeance of God? This is what we talked about last time. Human vengeance is taking life for someone has taken your life. The vengeance of God is to give his life before anyone could ever take his life. It is forgiveness. It is the wine press of the fury of the wrath of God that you can read about in Isaiah and the Revelation. It is the blood of the Lamb crucified from the foundation of the world. It's the violence of the kindness of God at the edge of time and eternity. And how does it work in time? Like that. Jesus is rejected by the authorities on Good Friday. Rejected. We all take his life, and he gives his life to all. In other words, he bleeds for every one of us. Someone sees and surrenders. Someone sees and surrenders to the judgment of God. I mean, maybe it's a Roman centurion, or, or maybe it's a thief hanging next to him, or maybe it's Mary, the harlot at the base of the cross. They, they surrender to his mercy. Then they, they forgive as, as they've been forgiven. They, they, they love as they've, as they've been loved. But you see, that's not a decision that can be legislated by the rulers and authorities and then enforced from the outside with threats and promises when a person loves. That's a decision that is made in communion with God in the sanctuary of each and every soul. In other words, it's free will. It's the decision of a vessel of wrath that was in bondage that has now become a vessel of mercy. And so, um, I put the wrong pieces there together because I'm not very good at this, but do you see how this is a, a radically different form of, of government than all the, than all the, the governments of, of this world? This is not like the governments of the, of the rulers and authorities of uh, this world. <laughs> this is the government of a body, uh, unified by one spirit, one breath, flowing through all the members. I'd pour wine in here if I thought it didn't make a mess. Unified by one spirit, one breath, flowing through all the members, 
and all under the authority of, uh, of one head. <laughs> So what I'm saying is this is not law. This is life. And freedom. My body parts are most free when they're all connected. And blessing. That's when I'm happy, when they're all connected. This is literally the righteousness of God. And how is it built? Not by people demanding their rights. Oh, this is my right. It's by people surrendering their rights as wrong. And literally becoming the righteousness of God. And now I hear the objections. Because believe me, I have objections. I want to just scream, if I live like this, I'll get crucified. And Paul would say, yep. Haven't you been reading my letter? That's exactly my point. Therefore, present your bodies a sacrifice, living, holy, and pleasing to God. Pick up your cross. Isn't it kind of ironic that all of our best arguments for human governments all add up pretty much to this, I think, that without them, well, you might get crucified. And yet, who was it that crucified Jesus? This is doubly ironic. It was the Roman authorities in collusion with the Jewish authorities, the religious authorities and democratic authorities all bound together in our best shot at a city, the city of peace, Jerusalem. I mean, that ought to wake us up. So what the heck is Paul talking about in Romans chapter 13? Let's read it again, and, I, and, I, and I'll try to give you the most literal translation, okay? So 1221, do not be overcome, do not be conquered by the evil, but overcome, conquer the evil in, literally in, the good. Let every soul, suki, be subject to higher authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. Now, that's nothing new. Paul already told us, right, in chapter 9 that God called Pharaoh and he hardened Pharaoh's heart for his purposes. In Jeremiah, it's been reading Jeremiah, it's crazy. God calls Nebuchadnezzar the king of Babylon. He calls him his servant who carries out wrath on the Jews and then called, God calls Cyrus king of Persia, calls him his servant who carries out wrath on Babylon. See, God institutes all authorities, but that doesn't mean that they're all good. I mean, your own psyche is an authority. It's not always good, is it? 1 Peter 2.13, Peter writes, be subject to every human institution, and yet you can read about it, Acts chapter 4, verse 18, the authorities charge Peter and John to never ever speak again or teach in Jesus' name. And they respond, we cannot but speak what we have seen, what we have heard. They recognize that there's an authority, truth, that is even higher than the authority of the Sanhedrin. So being subject doesn't mean doing whatever an authority tells you to do, even though the authority may be and is instituted by God. In Acts 4.23, just a few verses later, okay, after the authorities tell them that, Peter and John and all the disciples, they gather together. And what do they quote? They quote Psalm 2 about the rulers of the earth battling the Christ and Christ conquering the rulers of the earth. And then they start praising God that King Herod, Pontius Pilate, and the peoples had done and were doing exactly what God had predestined them to do. They praise God that in Paul's words, Romans 13, 1, these authorities, Pilate, Pilate Herod, the Sanhedrin, the, these authorities that exist have been instituted by God. Verse 2, so whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. Now, we assume that's bad. But the fact that God would judge between Peter and the Sanhedrin I bet Peter found that to be incredibly good. 
The fact that God would judge between Jesus and the opinions of Pilate, Herod, and the chanting crowd. I bet Jesus considered that to be good. If you speak against the authorities, it will produce some great distress in your soul. And the greatest comfort I know of is knowing that you will be judged by the highest authority, by God. Verse 3, for rulers are not a terror to literally the good work. You know, Jesus is literally the good work in human flesh. He felt pain, he wept tears, he did not enjoy the shame of being crucified, but he was utterly unafraid of Pilate, Herod, the crowd, and you. He even said to Peter, right after Judas kissed him and Peter had drawn his sword, he said, Peter, don't you know? Are you not aware that I can just ask the Father and he will send 12 legions of angels? But he didn't ask the Father. He didn't raise an army. He didn't start a revolution. He didn't even defend his rights in court. He drank the cup that his father had for him and submitted himself to the governing authorities. And now listen closely. That is exactly how he conquered the governing authorities. All of them. One of them being you. Right after Paul tells us that Jesus is the head of all rule and authority in Colossians, he writes this. And you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh. What is that? That's a vessel of wrath. God made alive together with Christ, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of death that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. So we took the life, and thus we owed the life, but on the cross Jesus surrendered the life and thus forgives the life from the foundation of the world. Verse 15, God disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in Christ. You see, the grace of God is not just a nice idea. It is the substance of a reality, of the reality on the other side of the curtain. It's that substance invading the illusions of this world. The rulers of this world crucify Christ, and he won't stay dead. Verse three, rulers are not a terror to the good work, that's grace, but to the bad work. That's our flesh. That's Mises and Wheezes. Would you have no fear of the authority? Then do the good, and you will have praise from it. Because Christ emptied himself, took the form of a slave, humbled himself to the point of death at the hands of the authorities, Paul writes to the Philippians that God has highly exalted him, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of the Father. In Ephesians, Paul teaches that Jesus defeated the rulers and authorities at the cross. And yet, through the church, Christ's body on earth, God is still, quote, or revealing, quote, his manifold wisdom to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. That's Ephesians 3. In other words, we broke the body of Christ and he bled the vengeance of God. And now, when people break your body, you can also bleed the vengeance of God every time you forgive, every time you feed your enemy or give him something to drink, every time you bleed the kindness of God. Verse four, the authority is God's servant to you for the good, but if you do the evil, be afraid, for it does not bear the sword in vain, for it is the servant of God, an avenger for wrath, to the one doing the evil. The evil is taking life and not giving life, and that's what fills all of us with wrath. And there is a place for this. There's a place for an eye for eye and a tooth for a tooth. But if you're a Christian, it's not your place. You are no longer working the vengeance of this age. You have been called to bleed the vengeance of God. Eternal, the life of the age to come, it's flowing in your blood right now. 
Verse 5, therefore one must be in subjection, not only to avoid wrath, but also for the sake of conscience, sunadesis, consciousness. You don't want to generate wrath by taking life and refusing to give life, but more than that, you are conscious of a reality on the other, the reality on the other side of the curtain, that we're all one body in Christ. And so you love your neighbor as yourself because your neighbor is yourself and the temple of the living God. For because of this, you also pay taxes. For the authorities are ministers of God, attending to this very thing. Pay to all what is owed to them. Taxes to whom taxes are owed. Revenue to whom revenue is owed. Respect to whom respect is owed. Honor to whom honor is owed. Owe no one anything except to love each other. (laughs) So did you get that? You do not owe taxes to the governing authorities. And yet Paul says, pay your taxes. Why? Well, because you love us. You love your neighbors. Owe no one anything except to love each other, for the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, the law, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and any other commandment, any other law, they're summed up in this word, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And now Paul is writing to the church in Rome. So, who's their neighbor? I'll give you a hint. The number of his name is 666. So what the hell is Paul saying to the church in Rome? Or better, what is the Spirit What is the Spirit saying through Paul to the church in Rome? You say you want a revolution. Well, don't start a revolution. Don't organize a political movement. Don't you, my dear, resort to legislation, adjudication, and do not try to execute the judgment of God, but Subject yourself to the governing authorities and you will bleed the judgment of God. The vengeance of God. The very reality of the age to come. I think the Spirit is saying, I know. I know that you are the last and the least. I know that you are the servants and the slaves and the women in Roman society. And you are the Jews who are now hunted and hated by Gentiles. You are the poor in spirit. You are those who mourn and you are the meek. But you have just discovered that you inherit the earth. And that of you is literally constructed the kingdom of God. For you are his beloved sons and daughters. And in you is a power absolutely immeasurable but you are about to be tempted by the tempter who will offer you the kingdoms of this world if only you will adopt his methods, methodeia, his organizational system. In seven years, some of you will be sewn in animal skins and fed to the dogs for the amusement of the crowd. Some of you will be dipped in oil, nailed to crosses, and set on fire to shed light on the orgies of the emperor, his garden parties. Peter, I once told you that one day another would bind you and take you where you do not wish to go. Peter, you will flee the city but you will see me entering the city and then bound by love, you will turn, run back into the city and be crucified upside down with me. And Paul, you will lose your head and the whole world will find it. But listen closely. You will be tempted. You will be tempted to curse your enemies. I'm calling you to bless them. 
You will be tempted to take their life. I'm calling you to bleed my life. You will be tempted to claim your rights, but I'm calling you to be my righteousness. You'll be tempted to start a revolution, but I'm calling you to be the revolution. You will be tempted to repay evil with evil, but I'm calling you to conquer the evil in the good. I am the good, and you are my body. No man hates his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it. And so I nourish and cherish you, and I will rise in you and with you and through you, and together we will sit on my throne, and there is no greater authority than that. My dearest church in Rome, we are about to conquer all things. Anyway, I think that's what the Spirit was saying to the church in Rome. And now check this out, church in downtown Denver. What are we reading 2,000 years later on a Sunday morning? (laughs) The wisdom of Nero? No. Paul's epistle to the Romans. And do you understand? We, 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 we are also being tempted. We're being tempted to adopt the illusions of the evil one. Why? So that we would surrender the power of God. We can battle the governing authorities with more governing authorities, but they're still governing authorities, and usually worse governing authorities, because we advertise them as good. And sometimes, God forbid, we even advertise them as the kingdom of God. And don't get me wrong on this, okay? So listen closely. I hope you care deeply about abortion, health care, immigration, immigrants, climate, the economy, yada, yada, yada. Why? Well, because they affect people. And yet, you know, our government doesn't have the power to change one person's heart. But you do. You can bleed the very vengeance of God. And so I I hope you vote, but you can do something infinitely more powerful than that. You can look for someone that considers you to be their enemy, and if they're hungry, you can feed them. If they're hungry. In other words, don't force feed them. That happens sometimes. But in all seriousness, try to find them and literally just pay for their lunch. And if they're thirsty, you can give them something to drink. And then we said, well, okay, right, yeah, right. This is America, Peter. I mean, everyone has more than enough to eat and drink. Who's hungry or thirsty in America, and what could I give them to eat or drink? Well, Jesus found his enemies, and he gave them something to eat and something to drink. He took bread. And he broke it, saying, this is my body given to you. Take and eat and do this in remembrance of me. And in the same manner after supper and having given thanks, he took the cup. And he said, this is the covenant in my blood, poured out for the forgiveness of sins. Drink of it, all of you, and do it in remembrance of me. I'm 61, and I feel rather powerless. So I watch the news a lot. You see, I think politics is tempting for me. Gives me the illusion of of power. But I'm reminding us that when we forgive as as we've been forgiven, when we love as we've been loved, when we're kind to the unkind, uh, we bleed the power of God, the revolution of God. So repent and believe the gospel. In Jesus' name, amen.
And so, Lord God, everything's going to be all right. <laughs> Father, together in Jesus' name, we bless the United States of America. And we bless the Republicans. And we bless the Democrats. We bless the independents and all the crazy people running around in the woods. We bless Russia. We bless Israel. We bless Palestine. We bless Great Britain and Germany and France and all of Europe and Asia and Africa and South America and North America. Everybody in Australia, anybody that happens to be hanging out in Antarctica, we bless them, Father, in Jesus' name. And Lord God, now we confess to you that we have been anxious over who wins the election. God, if we happened to elect Nero, we'd be just fine. For we are always one heartbeat away from the other side of the curtain. That makes us unstoppable and dangerous. So Lord God, would you help us to believe what you have told us? That we, Lord Jesus, might be your revolution on earth. That we would stop demanding our rights and we would become the very righteousness of God. For you have conquered. Help us remember what Paul wrote in chapter 8. I was just thinking about this while we were singing. In all these things, we are more than conquerors, he said to the Romans. More than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. And so, God, we confess to you our anxiety, our insecurity, our fear, and we thank you that you have conquered and we are in you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.